So good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started right now. Uh, my name is Alex Rosa. I'm the director of the European Heritage Research Team, and I'm also a uh, medical technology analyst uh, covering a number of other companies uh, for, uh, for Morningstar. I'm here to discuss uh, or to highlight some of the changes to the U.S. free working landscape and just the entire regulatory landscape that could potentially disrupt or flip economic modes, uh, as we call Morningstar, uh, in uh, medical technology. So, first of all, the, uh, the healthcare law was passed a couple of years ago, so why, why are you still focusing on this, on this topic so many years after its passage? So, uh, U.S. is still the key market for, for medical devices in terms of revenue, margins, capital deployment, uh, you name it. Uh, it's still, uh, the, the, the market pretty much affects uh, most of the medical device industry in the outside uh, fashion. So, for us, it's the most important market for, uh, to keep track of and to see the, the developments. And another thing is the U.S. regulatory reform, U.S. reform, contains so many provisions that are still very hard to quantify. It's important for us to just see how, uh, how they affect, uh, how, well, how long-lasting uh, the effect might be, and what, what kind of near-term uh, and the long-term expectations we should have regarding this, this space. So um, the initial reform provisions were fairly easy to quantify. You have the expansion of coverage, uh, uh, device tax, which interestingly enough is not, uh, interestingly enough is not suspended. And we actually don't think that it's going to come back, primarily because the device tax, for those unfamiliar, it's a 2.3% excise tax that's applied uh, to all medical devices uh, sales in the, in the U.S. Um, uh, and it was used to fund a lot of the reform provisions. So now this tax is suspended, and, uh, um, and most likely it will probably stay suspended because some of the, uh, some of the key uh, advocates of the, of the tax suspension are actually Democrats that, that, that come from the states of Massachusetts and Minnesota, two states which also happen to be some of the uh, largest in terms of the number of medical devices domiciled in two states. If you think of Minnesota, you think of Michigan, you think of St. Jude, uh, you, uh, you think of Massachusetts, uh, uh, you think that's where a lot of the uh, uh, Covidian operations are located. A lot of the a lot of medtech firms are uh, headquartered in those states, and for two of those Democratic uh, senators from two of those states, Despite the fact that the, the tax is really a Democrats' provision, they're definitely interested in, uh, in maintaining the relationship with the medical device lobby. So we, we suspect, uh, even though the provision is suspended for two years, it's going to be extended indefinitely. But there's still a few longer term mechanisms that remain very much opaque. Uh, we still have a tough time quantifying how the, uh, the, the shift uh, in certain dynamics focus on value as opposed to the fee for service will affect the volumes from the device. Made. So Medicare and Medicaid are uh, government-influenced programs, obviously. Medicare directly, Medicaid through state governments. Um, uh, but they're not the only ones who are changing. The for-profit uh, insurers are following the lead of many of the uh, governmental uh, insurance agencies. And reform in, in itself uh, is a pretty big deal, but uh, even a bigger deal is that it is a catalyst for the changes in the system. So the phasing out of the fee-for-service uh, system, which is, uh, uh, which is really the uh, U.S. is the only country that still uh, actively deploys the fee-for-service uh, system. And based on, uh, based on this, uh, of the system and shift towards more of a value-based approach is a very disruptive, uh, uh, disruptive uh, trend. There's going to be a lot more focus on quality and cost control. Cost control is also fairly tough to, uh, to quantify at, at this point. What, what, what form is it going to come in? Is it coming in the form of uh, uh, pricing discounts? Uh, reimbursement, uh, sh uh, shrinking reimbursement for all of the uh, uh, providers, or, or is it just going to be really just uh, uh, hospitals are going to be more aggressively negotiating with the uh, individual uh, device makers? Uh, device industry does have to adapt, and a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of them already have started to adapt. Um, some of the ways are to consolidate, and we've seen uh, uh, several large transactions uh, in the medical device space. Uh, obviously, Z uh, Zimmer Biomed is one. Um, Try Covidian is another one, so uh, we've already seen that, uh, that, that trend happening. And uh, uh, diversification is another way uh, uh, to offset some of, the, some, some of the pressures. You want to get out of the uh, areas, uh, uh, perhaps not exited, but uh, uh, minimize the uh, uh, impact of certain areas uh, where the government pressures would be particularly uh, meaningful uh, by diversifying into the uh, products that perhaps are not uh, as pressured. Uh, geographic diversification is uh, equally important. 
we've seen some of the moves that have a lot of the medical device companies made with a specific target uh, uh, of emerging, emerging markets. And invest in intelligently, but does that mean uh, you have to invest in R&D that actually will uh, result in uh, perhaps revolutionary rather than small evolutionary changes to the existing technology? Because in the past, it was very easy to pay for additional incremental bells and whistles. In the current environment, it's going to be tougher and tougher for, for medical device companies to get higher ASPs just on strength of uh, small modifications to the existing products. So in our opinion, since we focus so much on competitive advantages and uh, 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 the companies that, that possess the uh, modes, uh, possess the wide economic modes, perhaps the narrow economic modes, but they're, uh, they're best positioned to really withstand some of the pressures that we're going to be seeing in the U.S. for the next couple of years. So um, the way we look at it is uh, the, the, the reform implementation now has entered the second stage. The first stage was fairly uh, easy to quantify the, the, the accessibility. So uh, one of the biggest parts of uh, Obamacare was to uh, expand insurance coverage to uh, lots of unemployed uh, and un uninsured Americans, and that's going to be happening. It's already happening. The number of, uh, of folks that have coverage now is presently dramatic. So that's fairly easy to identify. The second, uh, second part is what's, what's really challenging. The focus of uh, um, really to, uh, to, uh, to provide quality of care, to change the way we look at quality of care, and balance that with controlling costs. And uh, well, thanks to the reform, we now see a wholesale shift uh, uh, to put providers and payers on the same side when it comes to financial interests. The payment reform, uh, they come in many different flavors. You have the ACO incentives, and ACO stands for accountable care organizations. Um, uh, they get savings from some of the bundles, they will pass them on to the, uh, to the consumer. Then you have um, uh, potential vendor discounts, consolidation of number of vendors that, uh, uh, that are being used. But ultimately, we, we're, still, we're still not quite sure how all the dynamics are going to play out over the next uh, three to five years. Uh, and as I said, as the, the biggest question mark is how the shift away from volume based payment and fee for service uh, towards more of a value approach, how that will. Uh, affect the, the overall dynamics. Momentum behind the, uh, the shift is growing. Uh, Medicare has already changed a lot of, the, uh, a lot of behaviors in, the, in space, and it's only going to continue to do so. Uh, CMS, uh, uh, CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, has indicated it tends to have at least 50% 50, uh, 50 of payments in alternative models by 2018. Alternative meaning not fee for service. So it's quite a dramatic shift. This shift is, however, sorely needed. Um, just as a reminder, uh, this is uh, where the U.S. is located uh, relative to the rest of the developed world, both on healthcare spending per capita and annual per capita healthcare costs by, by age. You can see that once the, uh, once the patients uh, hit 60, those costs really, really accelerate. Not coincidentally, this is also the age when most of the patients enter the Medicare. So as I said, with the, um, instead of changes, the pressures are uh, building up. You have the U.S. bonds decelerating. You have the specialist transitioning to hospital-based care. Uh, you have the reimbursement pressures. Uh, governments have access to big data, and big data in this case is actually working against uh, 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 against a lot of the device providers. So that increase in transparency, that's not necessarily a good thing for the, uh, uh, for the space. The opaqueness of the of the uh, uh, of the prices was always a pretty big selling point for, for the, well, I wouldn't say selling point, but it was a pretty good competitive advantage for device makers. And then finally, the, the providers consolidating, that's something that we've seen uh, accelerate over the last couple of years, both from the uh, hospital networks as well as the economy of care organizations. So as I said, fee-for-service uh, model to value-based approach, that's um, so that's a, that's a pretty, uh, pretty good shift, but the Medicare readmission rate started to fall in 2012 already in the response to, uh, to the way that Medicare is reimbursing for readmission. So this is something that just shows you that when Medicare starts changing the payment mechanisms, volumes definitely, uh, definitely fall. So um, the, point, uh, the point here is that Medicare does hold a pretty big power in the uh, in, in US, and when they put some of the financial incentives into place, or disincentives in this, 
in this case, uh, and the, the specific group refers to hospitals not getting reimbursed for readmissions. They tend to uh, pay attention a little bit more. So ACOs uh, is one of the um, one of the main outputs of uh, healthcare reform, and ACO is the what they call the accountable care organizations. Uh, so they receive bundled payments and are financially responsible for managing uh, the, 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 the costs and health outcomes of their uh, population of patients. So unlike a fee-for-service uh, network, you don't necessarily get reimbursed uh, based on the procedure, you get reimbursed on the total uh, out outcome. So uh, for, 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 for ACO to get reimbursed, they need to take the patient from, from the admission to release and the follow-ups, they get one uh, lump sum for that. And the ACOs uh, are rising in, in popularity. Some of, those, uh, some of those charts are a little dated, but you can see the trajectory. Uh, in Q1 2015, there were 744 uh, accountable care organizations in the US. That's up from just 64 40 years ago. And the number of ACO covered lives have increased dramatically as well, from 2 million when the healthcare reform was just implemented to about 23 and a half million by the middle of last year, and that number is only growing. Another important uh, dynamic uh, in the, in the, that's happening in the U.S. market is the decision-making process is shifting away from uh, from uh, from uh, specialists, surgeons, doctors to administrators, and uh, uh, part of it is because the administrators are obviously focused on uh, more focused on cost control. But another uh, uh, another part of it is the specialists are increasingly becoming employees of hospitals as opposed to uh, as opposed to independent contractors. The U.S. is also unique in that approach because the U.S. Uh, uh, up until recently uh, was primarily uh, all the specialists were primarily non-employees of hospitals, so they were uh, they were forming their own specialist groups, and then the, con uh, the hospitals would contract their services uh, um, and uh, they would perform their surgeries uh, in a, a particular hospital, but they would not necessarily be attached to any hospitals or contractually obligated to only perform their uh, uh, procedures at one hospital. That's changing. And why, uh, why is that important? Well, that's important because as, uh, as uh, 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 specialists become employees of, of hospitals, they have less and less say in terms of what devices they're going to be using. So uh, and, and in many ways, this, uh, this uh, relationship between specialists and device makers was, uh, well, it still is, but uh, was a very strong source of uh, economic moat. Switching costs are tremendous uh, when, when you're trying to force a, a, a surgeon to use a, a competitor's device. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's a big challenge. Now, the incentive for hospital administrators to obviously to make device uh, companies compete against each other on price, but uh, for that to, uh, to happen effectively, the specialist has to uh, not be incentivized to just uh, enjoy one particular relationship and uh, should be able to switch from one to the other. And as they become more and more salaried as opposed to independent contractor, that decision gets taken away from them uh, and get put based, uh, in the hands of the administrators. So we've seen a uh, shift in that dynamic for quite some time that the, the cardiac surgeons um, have been uh, moving into the, uh, into the salaried employee uh, ranks. Uh, the trends have been quite evident for a long time. The orthopedic surgeons for a long time resisted that trend, uh, thanks primarily to, uh, to maybe a more complex, uh, more diverse, uh, more differentiated offerings by, the, by some of the orthopedic providers, but arguably uh, the orthopedic uh, products are starting to get more and more commoditized, so the switch becomes easier and easier, and we we'll probably will see the number of orthopedic surgeons become salaried employees, that number will probably accelerate. Younger specialists are more likely to work at a hospital, so this is uh, uh, this is something that, uh, that we've, uh, we've noticed. We've been watching some of those trends for a number of years, and uh, uh, outsized proportion of the U.S. specialists are older docs, older meaning uh, 60 uh, 60 years and above. And as they starting to retire, as they uh, starting to sell their practices, they sell them to hospitals. Uh, they, they they quit, if, uh, and uh, the younger docs are more and more likely to work at a hospital. So what does that mean for the, uh, for the medical device uh, uh, space? First of all, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to point to the, to the uh, uh, what we call economic modes of the device space. And when you take a look at the healthcare in general, maybe outside of drug manufacturers, medical devices are uh, the companies that have the most, uh, uh, 
the, the strongest economic models based on our methodology. And an economic models, for those who are not familiar with our methodology, is the ability of companies to earn outsized excess returns for a durable period of time. So in this case, almost 90% of companies that recover in the med tech space have economic modes. Uh, some of that is, is a selection bias. We obviously prefer to com uh, cover companies uh, with economic modes, but you can see that, for example, relative to the biotechnology or healthcare services in particular, or even diagnostics and research, that this is the sector that's most frequently compared to as medical uh, devices. This is definitely a very modey uh, sector. And uh, uh, the modes, uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, primarily come from uh, uh, three factors, the intangible assets, solution costs, and uh, cost advantage. And uh, this is just a framework of how we look at the sources of economic advantage and how the different healthcare, uh, healthcare sectors benefit from this, uh, this particular sources. So um, in MedTech, as I said, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, companies with economic modes. But as I said, switching costs, something that's, that's been one of the strongest sources of, uh, of competitive advantage for medical devices is starting to erode. It's still very much a powerful mode source, but uh, uh, we, we've definitely seen a negative trend in that direction. So as I said, think your relationship with practitioners, uh, particularly with orthopedic and cardiac companies, high upfront costs, uh, raise raising blade model, uh, those are all contributors to, to high switching costs. But administrators' role is growing. And as administrators' role, uh, role is growing, the, the incentive to switch providers is increasing as well. Uh, some other sources of modes, the power and tangibles, R&D productivity. Uh, I specifically talked a little bit about R&D productivity. We've seen value of bells and whistles diminishing. That was a very big selling point back in the 90s, early 2000s, when we've seen the ASPs actually growing quite dramatically because uh, the upgrade cycle was every couple of years, and then upgrades sometimes were uh, as, uh, as basic as, uh, I don't know, just to make it an uh, iPhone analogy, but uh, like changing the case uh, from pink to blue, from black to pink. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the point is that uh, uh, there were very few revolutionary changes, that, uh, but uh, the ASPs were still growing because the medical device companies definitely had an upper hand uh, right in those conversations. We are starting to see a little bit of shift away from uh, some of those changes in part uh, because the, the pressures are growing, the reimbursement is not uh, expanding. As a result, we're starting to see a little bit more focus towards the technologies that have a very good cost-benefit um, uh, profile. But data support is very critical right now. So you've seen a lot of device companies uh, investing uh, aggressively in, uh, in data um, and there are a lot of clinical trials that are being run on the device companies, something that was not done in the past that much because Device companies in the US, they, uh, they have a very simple approval process. Uh, to, to sell devices, you just have to get a 510 uh, case stamp on, this, uh, uh, on, uh, on a device, meaning that it's just safe. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to show any kind of clinical benefit of a device relative to uh, to competing product or predecessor. Uh, so it's a very, uh, very simple process. Uh, in the past, it worked really well, not so much. Anymore. And then the uh, power of oligopolies, uh, that's something that we've seen a lot in the MedTech in the past. The Russian oligopolies, uh, uh, many industries are still attacked, but pressures are building. So uh, the, the, the summary, the bottom, uh, bottom line is that the re reimbursement regulatory changes in the US hold uh, significant potential to threaten competitive advantages over the long term. So MedTech uh, is also turned into acquisitions to offset a lot of this pressure. So I, I, I listed major acquisitions in the, the MedTech space kind of go, going back to 2013 as we saw uh, for, um, uh, for, for, that, uh, for those acquisitions. Further, uh, BD uh, bought Care Fusion. I, I call the product diversification. You can make an argument that they uh, made that acquisition because they wanted to take Care Fusion. Uh, but with the exception of maybe uh, a few acquisitions like Zimmer and Biomed, uh, 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 most of those acquisitions have one thing in common. You want to try to uh, limit risk, reduce risk in, uh, uh, in one particular area. Uh, consolidated market share um, uh, was the rationale behind the Zimmer Biomed acquisition. And uh, uh, in many ways, we're, we're now at the point that the orthopedic industry is uh, looking a lot like cardiac industry. You have three competitors controlling 90% share. Um, uh, that's a direct response to, to the fact that providers uh, are shy. They're, they're much more likely to, uh, instead of just uh, um, provide a, a basic step of approval and purchasing uh, three or four 
uh, competing device products, they are now more and more looking to consolidate. Maybe just go with the two, and then third, uh, uh, third guy is going to be the last guy out. So uh, in, uh, the acquisition of Zimmer, uh, uh, finally by Zimmer, was, uh, in our opinion, a direct result of, the, of, that, of, of that process. So the industry bifurcation and uh, an attractive environment proposition, obviously, we know what the interest rates are. The, the, the ability of a lot of those companies to take on additional debt is significant. That's really uh, uh, has provided a good, uh, strong catalyst for uh, for for takeovers. As I said, shift to value-based system is a, is a major development in the market. So we're seeing uh, some experimental deals uh, uh, that focus specifically uh, on a value-based system. Well, we have manufacturer rebates. Uh, um, at certain thresholds, of may, uh, may, for example, St. Jude agreed to pay a rebate of 40% of that price for CRT uh, uh, if flood provisions is required within the year of implantation. So, uh, so uh, forcing, forcing device makers to really become much more responsive and uh, uh, much more uh, proactive in what they're selling and uh, making sure that uh, you, you get paid for value, not just for selling the device. Uh, larger provider networks have greater databases, so they all, uh, they're, they're much better they're much stronger now at evaluating device performance, so they're not just uh, relying on data that's provided to them by manufacturers. The readmission penalty uh, has uh, potential to be uh, partially or perhaps even fully passed on to manufacturers. If you readmit the patient because your, uh, your device failed inside the patient's body uh, before the illness was in the, in the hospital to, uh, to, to eat the cost, increasingly we're starting to see device companies uh, sharing in that cost. One of the things that, one of the risks, uh, uh, perhaps risk, in, in our opinion, is that uh, the companies that uh, that live by innovation but also pack by innovation. So the, the, the companies that are very narrowly focused, their device players that really just focus on certain niches of, uh, uh, of the device space, uh, uh, are probably a little bit more exposed than uh, the companies that are much more diversified, like uh, like Medtronic or Stryker. So we've listed a few other uh, Zimmer, Sinju, primarily because they are much more focused. On The one-stop shop uh, preferred vendor approach is increasingly prevalent. I listed here the uh, the BT Care Fusion uh, chart that's straight from their um, uh, from their investor presentation uh, when they acquired Care Fusion. And you can see that there's a lot of complementary areas, and uh, uh, BT is definitely going towards the, the one-shop approach when it comes to the uh, when it comes to OR providing a, a surgical function. There's a, a, there are plenty of arguments why why you need bought care fusion, but that's definitely one. You focus on product on product breadth and solution rather than just selling innovative products. The emerging markets diversification is a, uh, is a very important trend. Uh, previously, you just used them as a source of cheap labor, but you have such significant penetration uh, uh, opportunity there that more and more device makers will turn away from North America. Uh, and uh, looking more and more towards emerging markets. I use Varian as an example. Varian is very much a uh, US century company, uh, controls the 70% of radiotherapy uh, instrumentation in the North America uh, marketplace. They've been growing very rapidly outside of North America, and uh, part of it, most of it is intentional. For example, you look at the, the major expansion to Brazil, uh, at the pri uh, price of the problem, perhaps not the greatest, but. Uh, uh, they still did get those sockets. They did. Uh, 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 they are actively diversifying away from uh, being a North America only market because radiotherapy uh, reimbursement in the U.S. is under pressure. So, this, this, so, what, uh, so how do we then uh, position? How do we look at the companies that are probably uh, most likely to? Uh, to resist some of those pressures, and uh, they're most likely uh, they're, they're, they're at the greatest, at the greatest risk of uh, being squeezed. So when we look at the companies that are, uh, that are small, uh, often private companies, they, they focus on innovation, they have promising technologies. That's how they, they, they will survive, because uh, they will not be able to compete on scale, they will not be able to compete on breadth of products, so what they try to do is they just try to uh, focus on, on individual technologies. And uh, that uh, uh, they also uh, have a pretty clear exit strategy in mind, which is being acquired by, by a larger, uh, larger player. Um, so that's some of the companies more on a smaller, no mode, uh, uh, no mode territory. On top of food chain, they have large first five device companies. They have wide modes, um, ample capital, ability to mass negotiate. You have some of those 
uh, companies like the Chai Pavilion that uh, the product growth is so extensive they can uh, they can agree or perhaps offer greater vendor discounts if uh, the Chai Pavilion combo becomes the, the preferred uh, uh, supplier of, uh, of uh, uh, products to, to a certain hospital. And then funding R&D, they're not necessarily, uh, they don't have any constraints in terms of uh, uh, funding R&D, they can launch into the fluid redeploy caliber in targeted areas. Uh, you have their ability uh, to use the clinical uh, database to their advantage, just, uh, just being larger um, uh, player in this case. And then the uh, stuck in the middle category, I don't necessarily uh, have any particular uh, examples. You can probably make an argument that maybe Abbott is uh, increasingly becoming stuck in the middle. You don't necessarily have a uh, threat to be a uh, top tier vendor. You have small market share within a certain niche. Uh, you are at greater risk of being left out, uh, perhaps not very exciting, commoditized product clients where you see a lot more pricing pressure. Um, so those are so, um, so we, we have this, so uh, we'll, we'll try to um, line up on the quality of their operations or competitive advantage, and also on, on the valuation premise of those companies from, the, from an investment perspective. So you look at that, we don't necessarily cover too many no-mode companies, um, uh, so there's only, only a few of them, but when it comes to narrow mode and wide mode, there's quite a, uh, 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 quite a diverse number of uh, companies uh, on all uh, sides of the spectrum here. So we took a look at some of the best ideas in that medical device space with companies like uh, Becton, uh, uh, narrow mode space, uh, where they're a little bit more exposed to the uh, uh, to pressure because they are uh, definitely, uh, I don't want to call them one trick ponies, but they definitely focus a lot more one uh, niche of the, of the device come out in the device industry, but they are fairly attractive to the device. And then uh, on the overvalued side, you have companies looking to research for the flight mode and a few other providers uh, in their markets. So that's, that's my presentation. So maybe at this point, uh, if you have any questions, uh, yes. <coughs> Can you give us an idea of what you think the volume table of these problems are? Chief service to uh, value approach. As in, if you think about the instance of hip replacements in the US compared to somewhere like the UK, is it 50% different? Uh, so you've got the company like Medtronic growing back in the 4%, which isn't going to grow at 4% anymore. Or uh, how significant is it? I, uh, I'll attempt to answer it, but the full caveat is that I don't cover uh, uh, hip companies and orthopedic companies. So, um, the, the question uh, is still uh, uh, whether the, the, the U.S. government can actually make the decision that this uh, 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 that this particular procedure is unnecessary. So uh, the, the problem with the, uh, with the, uh, well, the great thing about the device companies is that the alternative is if there's really no head-to-head -head clinical trials, uh, or you can actually say, well, this guy's doing just fine on, on pain medication. Uh, uh, well, you, the U.S. is. Uh, US, from, the, from that perspective, the, the companies, the orthopedic companies, are actually in a pretty good position because the only alternative of the, to to that plan is uh, pain medication. And um, uh, I don't think that we're at the point yet that the US government is going to be uh, forcing all of its uh, retirees uh, or Medicare recipients to just uh, start taking a lot of uh, OxyContin uh, instead, of, uh, instead of getting uh, head replacements. So, um, yes, the prevalence of, uh, uh, of head replacements relative to the US. Uh, relative to Europe is higher, uh, but we are not necessarily seeing that the volumes uh, pressure uh, um, uh, from that perspective. Maybe, uh, maybe the best way to answer this is where you draw the line between the elective procedure and non-elective procedure. And from what we've seen so far with the first part, we don't necessarily view the hips uh, uh, as an elective procedure just yet. So on the volume, from the volume perspective, I don't necessarily see the pressure yet. It's really just going to come from the prices side. You mentioned uh, electively, you must be hated. Yeah. Why? Uh, uh, bad management, broken growth story, uh, some of the problems with. Uh, <coughs> I, I don't want to say that. Uh, I want to say aggressive accounting yeah, uh, historically. Yeah. Uh, historically uh, it's, it's, it's one of those situations that, uh, that, uh, that the company had a very robust uh, uh, growth uh, profile over the last five, six years, and perhaps some of it was completed by some of the more aggressive practices that they take when it comes to selling. Now we uh, kind of come to this screech call where the U.S. business completely fell off. Uh, 
and uh, the growth is already to a point actually declined dramatically last year. So the, the, uh, the street investors in general, they hate, they hate the company because uh, they don't see any catalyst in the horizon. This company just had uh, lost one after another string of negative news uh, management this. Uh, in many, uh, many folks' opinion, this is uh, not the greatest. So um, when you don't have that, that, uh, that catalyst in the horizon, when you have depressed earnings, uh, very little growth in the next year or two, um, the street tends to just kind of uh, give up on this one, put it in the whole bucket, don't worry about it until, until we see some growth in time. We think that there is a lot of value. Uh, we think that the right now the stock is trading at the point where, uh, where all the growth, uh, potential growth is completely dismissed. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the multiple right now does not look attractive until the next year earnings, but next year earnings are extremely depressed. And uh, the following year earnings are probably not going to be uh, uh, that robust either. There's going to be a significant uh, growth in them, but still not enough to perhaps justify the, the current multiple. I think what we'd like in, uh, uh, going forward is that uh, the company uh, is operating in a Fairly rational oligopoly with Varian. It has a very strong market growth uh, potential. Uh, the entire RT market, radiotherapy market, we expect will grow somewhere in the range of about 5 to 7 percent. And Electra is actually a better position than Varian from that perspective because it grows much more to emerging markets, where the, uh, the growth profile of emerging markets is much more robust. And we also think that there's a lot more opportunity on the aftermarket sales. Uh, in the past, the, the Electra was just selling hardware and uh, they were selling hardware, they were selling software and services, but they're all selling them separately and perhaps not uh, in a coordinated fashion. So now they have enough installations, uh, they, they're still going to be aggressively selling uh, uh, hardware, but now they're going to be working more closely with the, with the software and service people to really sell the entire suite of uh, solutions, particularly to the U.S. market. So the U.S. market right now is a tough one for the for left left. I think that's, uh, it's not a dead market for left. I think they just still probably get back to somewhere in the uh, mid to high uh, 20s uh, percent of market share that they were taking in the past. It's still a variance market, but I think that the, uh, even more importantly is just the growth profile outside of the US, which is, uh, <coughs> should be quite robust. Yeah. Um, can I just ask a question about the, uh, you also know about the specialists who want to work in hospitals. Um, can you say a bit more about that? Because, um, I don't know, well, Medmax is kind of like a reason why I don't know if you know Medmax, but they have um, Post natal acute uh, care, uh, they have radiology, and physiology specialists. And uh, my, my impression from following them is that they're still quite happy to kind of grow um, across those three areas within hospitals uh, as, a sort of, as independent sort of hospitals. So um, I was sort of struck by your comment about your view of elections, specialists, and basically employees. Yeah, I can specifically talk about Medmax and not necessarily specifically talk about uh, some of their, uh, some of their uh, docs, specifically anesthesiologists. Uh, what we have seen now uh, over the last couple of years is that you kind of look at that, uh, going back maybe six, seven, eight years ago when, when we had plenty of med, uh, cath labs, independent cath labs. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of a company called Medcath. Uh, it was the largest, uh, uh, well, largest cath labs, uh, uh, network of cath labs in the U.S. The reimbursement pressure started coming down uh, uh, seeing more and more of their specialists migrating to the hospitals. Uh, so that's the, that's the cardiac uh, surgery. Then the orthopedics, we've seen this increasing uh, trend. It's still off very low numbers, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's steadily growing uh, where, where they are becoming salary docs. Um, and, and most of it is really just driven uh, by, by reimbursement. There is a different uh, reimbursement profile for hospital-based operations and uh, independent uh, uh, freestanding centers uh, 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 operations. You look at, for example, uh, radiotherapy. Back in 2005, well, actually even going back to the late, late 90s, the freestanding centers have exploded in popularity because the reimbursement profile has been so good. Since late 90s, early 2000s, the reimbursement of freestanding centers versus the hospital-based uh, radiotherapy has gradually been uh, coming down, so you have the gap is shrinking. And uh, uh, at this point, we're almost at par when it comes to reimbursement. And given that the, the freestanding steps are running uh, uh, less uh, efficient operations, uh, they need the higher reimbursement uh, uh, rates to, to stay in business. So their, uh, uh, um, their alternative is either they sell themselves to hospitals 
or they actually become part of a larger network. So there are some of the larger facilities that act as aggregators of some of the mom and pop practices. And when you, when you actually gain enough volume, you can become maybe a little bit more competitive, even in light of uh, more uh, challenging reimbursement profile. You can actually gain a little bit more volume leverage. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you, you can operate, uh, even if, you, if you're reimbursed at par with hospitals, you can still, um, can still operate. Now, the flip side of this, actually, but maybe a more of an exception to the rules, you have uh, companies like Platform and Quest that are actually very good at competing with, uh, with, uh, with hospitals, despite that they actually have lower reimbursement profile than hospitals because they're so, uh, so effective so, uh, because of their scale. So that's the, uh, the opposite spectrum. But I don't think the MedMax is in a position where it controls 50% of the, uh, of the market for, uh, uh, for, uh, for those services. And in my opinion, when you kind of look at the uh, lab work with Quest, their market share of the independence and relative to the hospital based the diagnostics, uh, it's significant. So you have to have scale to, to effectively compete uh, as an independent.